If you want to parameterize your robot, for example to perform a dynamic simulation, you typically use minimal or generalized coordinates, where each joint is associated with a variable to describe your system. Another way of describing your system is to use so-called maximal coordinates, where each link has six degrees of freedom and is directly linked to a global reference frame. To account for the constraints in a system, we then have to add Lagrange multipliers to enforce the actual kinematics. Now you might ask the question, why would we want to use maximal coordinates if they have a lot more variables? But imagine our two robots here have to carry this bar together. Then what we actually do is, we form a mechanism with so-called closed kinematic loops. And describing such a closed kinematic loop in minimal coordinates is no longer trivial, whereas in maximal coordinates, the parameterization process doesn't really change. And this is why I would like to present to you a rigid body dynamics algorithm in maximal coordinates and based on variational integrators. So the first question to answer is, what are variational integrators and why are we using them? And the best answer is to take a look at what happens if we simulate a system with regular numerical integrators, for example with the explicit Euler method. If we simulate this double pendulum here with this method and a small time step of one millisecond, what you can see is that the simulation performs seemingly correct even though, if you look very closely, you can already make out that the links are slightly drifting apart. Now, using a larger time step of 10 milliseconds, this drift becomes clearly larger. And if we go even further and now do 50 milliseconds, then what you will see is that the drift becomes so large that the whole simulation just doesn't make any sense anymore. This is why normally for mechanical systems with constraints, you have to use constraint stabilization schemes to prevent drift. But that comes with its own numerical issues and this is why they're not really ideal. And for this reason, we're using variational integrators because they do not incur drift even without using additional stabilization schemes. So they're the perfect match for using maximal coordinates. Let's take a closer look at how we can derive variational integrators. We start off with the continuous time setting. If you have an object, for example this ball, we can of course associate a kinetic energy T and a potential energy V with the system. And taking the difference of the two basically describes the liveliness of the system. So if our kinetic energy is large, then we have a large value and our system is very lively, and if the potential energy is large, then our system is rather still and not very lively. This difference is typically called the Lagrangian, and what we can do now is we can take the integral over time of this Lagrangian, and we call this the action of the system. And again, a large action simply means our system is very lively. Now, some time ago, it was discovered that nature follows a principle of least action, which means it tries to be as still as possible and avoid being very lively. If we translate this to mathematics, this simply means that we get the physically correct trajectory of a system simply by minimizing its action over time. The thing that's special about this minimization is that we have to minimize over trajectories, not just variables. But the way you do this is actually quite straightforward. You assume fixed boundary points for your trajectory, and then you simply vary the trajectory in between, which is why it's called a variation. And the goal is to find the trajectory that minimizes your action integral. If you do this correctly, this simply gives you the equations of motion of your system, and to put it on a computer, you could use a standard numerical method, for example, a Runge-Cutter method. But if we do it this way, we do not necessarily maintain important properties of our system, for example, energy conservation or constraint satisfaction. So what people came up with is saying, instead of discretizing this process at the very end, why don't we just discretize the whole derivation? Following this idea, if we discretize the action integral, we get an action sum, where now we minimize over naught points xk, and we also get a discretized variation. And because we discretize the whole derivation, the resulting discretization actually preserves the structural properties of the system, such as energy conservation or constraint satisfaction. To get some more intuition of why variational integrators actually perform better than regular discretization schemes, let's look at some examples. If we have a differential equation, for example, x dot equals f of x, and we discretize it, what we actually do is we find the exact discrete version of a different differential equation, often called the modified equation. And exact in this case simply means that the two equations, at least theoretically, overlap at the discrete naught points. Now, in this picture, you see the actual differential equation as a dashed line and the modified equation as a solid line. And you can see that the discrete version, the dotted line, is a lot closer to the modified equation than to the actual equation. Now, to go over another example, here you see the explicit Euler method with the modified equation as a solid line spiraling outwards, and the discrete approximation, of course, closely tracking it. But the problem is that the actual system is periodic. So in a sense, our actual system could be energy conserving, but our modified equation, and therefore the discrete approximation, are not. On the other hand, if we use a variational integrator, in this case the symplectic Euler method, we can see that now the modified equation is periodic, 
and therefore the discrete approximation also has the structure. And even though we have a slight deviation from the actual system, because the actual and the modified equation are structurally similar, we get a very good performance. To come back to the drifting links from the beginning, if we use a variational integrator, also just with order one, we no longer get constraint drift, even though our time step is twice as large as the largest one for the drifting pendulums. The simulation that you see here actually ran for 10 hours without changing its behavior at all. Combining variational integrators with maximal coordinates, where again we treat each body individually and add constraints to connect them, is quite straightforward. We start out with the discrete action sum and then vary the discrete trajectory to minimize the action. Since in maximal coordinates we always have to deal with constraints, we also have to look at how to add them to this derivation. If you have a constraint, for example, that these two links should be connected together, you can just form a simple implicit equation that describes the setting, and you can add these constraints to discrete action sum with so-called Lagrange multipliers. This is just the same as adding constraints to a regular optimization problem. To derive a simple first-order integrator, we only look at a very short trajectory consisting of three naught points, and since the boundary points have to be fixed, we can only vary the point in the middle. And now we find the optimal value simply by taking the gradient of the action sum with respect to this naught point and setting it to zero as for a regular optimization problem. And this gives you your equations of motion. If we follow this derivation for the translational dynamics, we get the following equation, which might look a bit confusing at first, but it's actually just f equals ma if you look closely, and additionally we have a gravity term and the mapping of the constraint forces. For the rotational dynamics, it's similar. We get this slightly more complicated equation, but this is actually just Euler's equation for rotations plus the mapping of the constraint forces. And as the final set of equations, we have to take care of our constraints. We now rename the translational dynamics dt, and we stack our variables into the variable s. Then we do the same for the rotational dynamics, calling them dr, and rename the variable as well. And the constraints are also written in terms of s. And then we stack everything into a function f of s. So if we find a solution to this equation f of s equals zero, then we've successfully integrated our system forward in time using a variational integrator. The remaining question is now how can we do this integration efficiently? Typically, if you have such an equation f of s equals zero, what you do is you apply some form of Newton's method where we iteratively linearize the system of equations to get a better and better approximation of the solution. Here you see the standard Newton step where capital F is simply the Jacobian of our function f. And if we reformulate this slightly, we get this linear system where we are looking for delta s containing our solution the next time step. Normally, instead of directly inverting capital F, you would factorize F first. This means splitting it up into more easily invertible matrices. In our case, we use the LU factorization, which means we split it up in a lower triangular, diagonal, and upper triangular matrix. And such factorizations normally have complexity O n cubed, where n is simply the dimension of our function f. Next, you would do a back substitution, so you invert L, and then D, and then U, to get your solution. The problem with this procedure is, of course, that the cubic complexity would scale really badly to larger and larger systems, which is why we would like to have something more efficient. How do we get something more efficient? Well, if you look at a mechanism, for example this one with five links and four joints, we can directly create a graph where we have a one-to-one -one match, with the square nodes representing links and the circular nodes representing joints, and the numbering is just the same. We can then also look at our Newton step and specifically at our matrix capital F, and what's interesting now is that there's also a direct correlation between this matrix, the graph, and the mechanism. Here's how you can actually see this. The nodes are just listed on a diagonal of the matrix, so node 1 is the first entry, node 2 the second, and so on for all the links. And if we go on to the constraints, node 6 is of course also on a diagonal, and then you have off-diagonal entries, which just mimic the connections to the links, so in this case, to nodes 1 and 2. And this also holds for all of the other constraints. If we process this matrix with an LDU factorization, the way we actually do this is we go from top left to bottom right. So we look at the diagonal entry, and then the off-diagonal ones, and then the next diagonal, and so on, and so on. We can also look at how this relates to the graph at the same time. So if we start working on node 1, which means eliminating it from the graph, then we have to connect the nodes that were previously connected to the eliminated one. So since 6 and 9 were connected to this node, we now have to connect those two together. And in turn, this connection also shows up in a matrix connecting nodes 6 and 9 in form of fill-ins, where previously zero values are now non-zero. The same happens if we remove node 2, we have to reconnect nodes 6, 7, and 8, and we also get fill-ins at the off-diagonals connecting these nodes in the matrix. The next node is also very interesting. If we remove node 3, 
we don't have to form new connections and so there's also no change in the matrix. The same is true for 4 and 5. But then we go to node 6 and we have to add connections between 7 and 8 and as before we get fill-ins in our matrix. What you can see now is that if we just directly factorize the matrix we get some unknown amount of fill-ins so we no longer know what our matrix looks like. And this means we have to treat it as a dense matrix with a factorization of cubic complexity. But we can be more efficient if we approach this in a more structured way. We saw that removing leaves from the graph does not create any fill-ins, so if we walk through the matrix in this way, going from the leaves to the root, we could do a lot better. All we have to do for this is reorder the rows and columns of the matrix the right way. And we find this correct order by performing a simple depth-first search a single time at the beginning. Looking at this reorder matrix, we start with node 5 and then node 9, which has become a leaf as well, then node 3, and then 7, and 4, and 8, and 2, and 6, and 1. And because now we only remove leaves from the graph, we do not get any fill-ins, which means we know exactly what our matrix looks like. To be more specific, we have n nodes for n links, and we also just have one constraint per link, at least for a mechanism without closed kinematic loops. Then in total we have 2n nodes, or 2n-1 nodes, for floating-based systems. And since the structure of the matrix does not change, we have a fixed number of computations per node. And so in total, we have a complexity of ON, which means the algorithm scales linearly with the number of links in a system. Note that for systems with closed kinematic loops, we sometimes can remove nodes without creating fill-ins. And so the complexity is no longer linear, but we can still get pretty good results. We've implemented our algorithm in Julia, which is a really nice programming language with syntax similar to MATLAB, but you can get performance close to C, which makes it ideal for developing new algorithms quickly, but also making them performant. The code is hosted on GitHub, where you can have a look at the algorithm and run your own simulations by parsing URDF files. We've compared our maximal coordinate algorithm to an algorithm in minimal coordinates, both were written in Julia. For this comparison, we looked at n-link pendulums, like the one you see on the left, going from one link to 100 links. And we chose two different joint types, revolute joints with one degree of freedom and ball and socket joints with three degrees of freedom. On the right, you can see the results, where our algorithm is in blue and the minimal coordinate one in red. The revolute joints are the solid lines and the ball and socket joints are the dashed lines. Of course, the minimal coordinate algorithm is the fastest for revolute joints because a system with only revolute joints is the ideal situation for minimal coordinates, but our algorithm still performs reasonably well. On the other hand, if we use ball and socket joints with three degrees of freedom, with maximal coordinates we perform better than before because we have less constraints to take care of, whereas the minimal coordinate algorithm now is a lot slower. To us, the main conclusion from these results is that maximal coordinates are generally totally competitive to minimal coordinates and not just a niche solution for specialized situations. We also compared our variational integrator in maximal coordinates to other variational integrators in minimal coordinates with the Revolut joint pendulum setup. The minimal coordinate implementations were written in C++, and overall, again, there's no clear distinction to be made between minimal and maximal coordinates. But what's even more interesting is that if we increase the desired simulation accuracy by setting the tolerances lower, our algorithm performed well even for the lower tolerances, while the other implementations had some issues for larger systems and at some point failed to find solutions, which could indicate that maximal coordinates might be more numerically robust. This is also supported by the next experiment. Here we simulated this chain of closed loop segments where we often have almost singular configurations. And while we could do this robustly, even without any regularization, the minimal coordinate algorithm in Julia failed if we had more than one or two of these segments. This again hints at maximal coordinates being more numerically robust. In conclusion, it's fair to say that maximal coordinates are generally competitive to minimal coordinates, and they're a valid alternative depending on the situation. In addition, maximal coordinates have some advantages over minimal coordinates, especially when dealing with constrained mechanical systems. Because they're built on treating constraints, adding additional constraints, for example for loop closures, can be easily done. Secondly, because of the variational formulation, we do not have constraint drift that you would normally get when numerically integrating constraints with standard minimal coordinate algorithms, where you then need stabilization schemes. And thirdly, as you saw in the results, maximal coordinates seem to be more numerically robust than minimal coordinates, especially close to singular configurations. For future work, the first thing we'd like to do is incorporate higher order integrators to take even larger time steps, which is really helpful for real-time control, such as model predictive control. And then we would like to be able to treat inequality constraints, for example, to handle contact interactions, so that in the future, our robots from the beginning can actually have legs and walk around while performing their tasks.